Hey, Discern listeners, 90 Day Fiance, let's watch. Reasons for wanting to like abstain from sex before marriage. I didn't bring this up because it's kind of awkward for me at least. Um, I'm just wondering over the last couple of years when we've been apart, have you hooked up with somebody? Like, just tell me, like, you're a good looking dude. You're like a personal trainer. Like, it's such a cliche. Like, who does the rich housewife hook up with? The personal trainer. Okay, so I wonder where this question is coming from. The way she's, the, the vibe of her question seems like, to me, she's open if he were to say yes. A lot of couples are like this. You could say they're on the polyamorous spectrum or something where they're just like, uh, I've treated couples like this where they're like, hey, you know, I know you went to Burning Man. Did you get together with anyone? Uh, it's not great if you did, but, uh, you know, I'd rather just know about it. Whereas you'll have couples that w if the answer was, yes, I did get together with someone, it would be a deal breaker or a very, very difficult thing to deal with at that point. So there, there's a spectrum there. She is asking the question as if it's no big deal, as if she's just like, hey, you know, that's the past. Just let me know. You know, in the Matt, it's, how much time were they away from each other? They're away from each other for a long time. Let's see. Uh, met in India one month after meeting. They were engaged. He proposed, and they haven't seen each other for two years. So the two years of time, she could be like, "Look, we were apart." I'll tell you the truth. I got together with an old boyfriend, and you know, we got drunk one night, and. I, you know, I made out with him for five minutes or something. But so now <laughs> you don't want to just be flippant about disclosing that. But anyway, point is, is that from her vibe, it sounds like she's open to hearing either answer. She wouldn't like to hear that he got together with someone, but she's not going to have it be a deal breaker. That's the way she's delivering it. But I've, we've had no indication thus far that she is open to that. So let's see how this goes. And it's a viable concern, and I appreciate her being forthcoming about that. A lot of people, even on the show, when they have this worry, they will manifest it in other ways rather than just asking straight out. Now, if he cheated and he was lying to her, then why would he say, yes, I did cheat on you? <laughs> but it may be that's why she's trying to deliver it in a way that it at least gives the impression that she's open to whatever answer. I'm, I didn't want to ruin things, but today I need to address it. I bring this up because faithfulness and honesty are really important to me. As I told so you. So you would tell me if you had. I told you before as well that I was like, a, totally engaged myself into my work. It was like 16 hours working, so I didn't have time to do these kind of things. I hope he doesn't end there because that's not a very reassuring response. <laughs> you know, if I were to ask my wife, have you ever cheated on me? And she's like, I haven't really had any time to. I mean, that implies like if you did have time, you would have, or you would have been at least at risk of that. So yeah, the answer to that question should just be, no, of course not. I don't want to cheat on you. You're the love of my life. We're committed to each other. I'm not that sort of person or whatever. Not, I didn't have time to. <laughs> I was not available for anyone. Okay. Yeah. But I just want to make sure, like for the record, you've not hooked up with anybody in the last two years. You haven't chat with people that potentially you could hook up with. No, I got a lot of compliment from my online client as well. But not trying to like uh, come in a relationship or something like they just, uh, it, it was a healthy conversation between uh, two people. Right, right. So that's like that. Okay. So he's saying, yeah, I communicate with various people online, but it wasn't flirtatious or anything. It was just a healthy communi communication between two people. And it sounds like Jen is okay with that, which is good. So it looks like this is a pretty healthy conversation. It's it's normal. You can ask these questions and you could ask for reassurance. It, it seems kind of absurd, right? Because if you were to ask your partner, it's just like, have you ever cheated on me? And they're just like, no, I've never cheated on you. I mean, that's what a cheater would say if they cheated. That's also what a non-cheater would say if, if they hadn't cheated. So it's a bit of a thing there. But I don't know, sometimes it's just good to get that reassurance. And as I've said before in other videos, we never know if our partners are cheating on us or not. If they're, Unless we are physically with them all the time, we can't know. And even if we're physically with them, they could be flirting on their phone or something, they could be sexting or whatever. 
So you just don't know. They could be you know, constantly fantasizing about someone else, and you just would never know. And that happens sometimes, unfortunately. It's very hurtful and can be traumatizing relationally to the victim of that. But it's unfortunate. We just, we just don't know. And the way we build trust is not through complete scientific fact that our partners aren't cheating on us. We build trust through goodwill, attachment, love, experience. The reason why I trust my wife isn't because I've been watching her this whole time. It's because, I don't know, we just have built a life where she doesn't deceive me and she follows through and she is a truthful person and she doesn't do things that are even in that direction, right? She doesn't um, flirt with men. She doesn't I don't know. It, it, I could name various different things that would concern. But even if she had done stuff like that, I, I still don't think she would have cheated on me because we just have so much trust. You, you build that over time. And I always say this, that of course, Jen does not trust Rishi because they barely know each other. They think they know each other because they've been talking online for two years, but they've had a total of a month together. What, what did I say earlier? Jen, let's see, a month after meeting, they got engaged. Yeah. So or I don't even know how many, oh, it was 45 days together total. So they've had 40, 45 days. Uh, for some people, that's like, you know, what is that? Maybe 10 dates at the, well, I guess you could have 45 dates if you really, but for some people that's, you know, it's not a lot of time. Uh, it certainly isn't a lot of time in my book. I, I certainly wouldn't trust someone after 45 days in terms of this sort of thing. So you just have to live in that ambiguity. You just have to be like, well, he said he didn't cheat, but I don't know. But if, for example, they had 20 years into their relationship and they were together most of that time and there weren't any indications of cheating or deception or ill will between the two people or irresponsible behavior on his part, then she would be able to say, I don't even need to ask him because even though I guess it's possibly cheated on me, but I, I just can't see it. It just doesn't make any sense. Having said that, there are examples of people answering it that way after 20 years saying, there's no possible way. I, I can't imagine my partner cheating on me. And it has still happened. So I'm not saying that we can ever know is the point. And I know that might freak some of you out, particularly you pre preoccupied folks or that you relationally traumatized folks who have been betrayed or cheated on. It, it sucks. There's just no way to know. And that's why love is magical, <laughs> because if there was certainty to it, it wouldn't carry with it the magic and the fear and the glory and the ups and downs. It, it just sucks that we, we can't know for sure. We have to go on faith. Even if your pardon, partner hadn't cheated on you, you don't even really know if your partner really loves you. <laughs> right? How do you define that? They could be tricking you the entire time. They could just be acting like they love you. You don't know. You just have to go on faith. You have to go on your experience. You have to take that leap and say like, well, I have every reason to believe that my partner does love me, but I can't know for sure, but I'm going with the assumption that they do. And when you have enough experience behind you in your life that teaches you that generally that works out, then you trust that and you take that leap. But if you have a lot of relational traumas, then you might need a lot more reassurance. There's, a, there's ways of getting that reassurance. You might need to ask for 10 times the reassurance that you would otherwise, but there are healthy ways of getting that reassurance, but you'll never know for sure. And we have to live with that. And I say that because some people, and I've worked with clients like this, they want scientific factual proof that their partner is not cheating and their partner loves them and, and will never leave them. And there's just, there's, and they think that that answer is out there. They're always, the preoccupied person is always chasing that. They're chasing that. They want that fact. They want that absolute concrete establishment that the relationship is strong and will never end and their partner loves them and is will never cheat and you know there's no threat there there's there's no way to have that even in a good relationship you'd never know things could go south quickly and you could get divorced you just don't know so the answer the solution isn't to find an answer to that question because there is no answer to that question the the solution is all the other things involved in the therapeutic treatment of preoccupied attachment which i've talked about in my deep dives in my other videos i do trust rishi i don't see any reason not to trust him unless something happens like some girl comes and knocks on my door and says why are you with my man i'm fine i feel like things are moving forward there's nothing that's making me doubt 
that he is still committed and things are on the right track. Okay, that's good. So uh, she was saying something earlier where when she was talk- talking with her friend and she was saying that in the past she would overreact. I don't know if it was Rishi or someone else when she would see Rishi or someone else on Instagram or social media and she, according to her, would overreact and that seemingly was in the direction of preoccupied insecure attachments and unfair interpretations and behavior towards her partner. But And that's why she was not really even looking at his social media or at least not uh, looking at it that closely. And so that was a sign of like, uh uh-oh, are we looking at someone who has preoccupied attachment, doesn't really know it, and they have some measures in place to manage it, but hasn't really healed from it and isn't really self-aware of it. Um, I don't know. I never know. But now it's kind of put to the test, her attachment security, and she trusts. One of the hallmarks of secure attachment is that you have reasonable trust. You don't trust everyone, of course, but you have reasonable trust. And I I think she's basically saying what I was saying earlier, which is just like, look, I I don't know. I mean, I suppose maybe she didn't say this, but I think it's kind of in her language. But until I have some overt uh, indication that he is cheating, there's no reason to believe he is, and I'm just going to continue in this relationship until there is some indication that he was. So, you know, I th- that's that's a very healthy, balanced point of view. I trust you, but I want you to trust that if I find out that you're lying to me, we can't be together because I'm like giving you an opportunity to be 100% honest and. If I found out you're not, like, that is probably worse than you having had sex with somebody else. Interesting. Yeah, that's kind of what I was hearing earlier when she was asking. I think in her mind, she's like, well, best case scenario, he didn't cheat. Down from there is he cheated, but he tells me, and we work it out. Down from there is he cheated and he lied to me, which is much worse than if he cheated and he told me. It's not great if he cheated, but, you know, we were apart for... Two, two years. I remember <laughs> the, the thing this reminds me of is when we were kids, like 13, I, there were romantic relationships among my friends. And I remember some of them would say, well, let's just say for the summer, we're not really going out. But as soon as school starts up again, we'll be going out again. Basically saying, look, if either one of us gets together with someone over the summer, because who knows, we'll be at camp or whatever, <laughs> then that's that's okay. And and, and so it kind of reminds me of that. It's like, well, you know, two years, we're apart, things happen, but now we're starting our life finally. And so now we start with an exclusive situation. Any cheating from this point forward is much worse than, uh, than uh, to me. And, you know, I think that's what she's saying. And she's saying, if you cheat, not great, but if you lie, that's a billion times worse or at least significantly worse. And I think I think that's a pretty healthy view. I'm, I'm often, people can have their own position on this, but I'm often promoting that, or at least introducing that idea that the cheating or the behavior that was bad is one thing, but it's the lying that really erodes a relationship. It's the lying that completely erases any kind of trust because if your partner is willing to lie to you, then you can't you can't know anything. You can't know if they're not cheating more. You can't know if they really love you. They can't know if they plan on spending the rest of their life with you. You can't if they go to work and they say I'm going to work. You you can't know if they're actually going to work. It just destroys a relationship. Whereas if you cheat, that's not great, and there is de- there's deception in there. But say you cheat, and then a month later say I gotta I gotta tell you. Last month I cheated, and it's so bad. That what that sets is a precedent that, okay, cheating not great, and you can make your own choice if you were told that by your partner. But at the very least, you're like, well, but they'll tell me. So then, say you fa- you recover, and five years later, there's been no indication of cheating, and your partner hasn't told you about cheating. Then it's a tick in the column of well, if they cheated, at least there's a precedent that they'll tell me or they'll indicate something to me. So I have even more reason to believe that they haven't cheated. The 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 problem is is that most cheaters never do that <laughs> most cheaters not only will not come forward but when they're confronted with 
proof that, or at least very suggestive data that they have cheated. You know, the partner comes to you, I can see your texts, you know, where were you? I got this, I, someone told me that da da da. The cheaters will deny, deny, deny. And then once they finally have to admit it and they admit it, then they won't give all the details. They'll be like, it was just once. And then later on it comes out, it was several times. And it's like, okay, fine, it was five times, but it was only one person. And then it comes out, it was multiple people. And now we're hitting in a road of just like, why are you in this relationship? But it depends, you know, the, people can, people still recover from pretty significant infidelity like that. But my point is, is that I've had very, a lot of frustrating conversations with people who cheated in recovery, whether it's individual or couple therapy, and I'm telling them, so it's actually kind of a dance because on one hand, when you commit a transgression like that, a trust violation like that, if you wanna build the trust back, and usually the cheater does, then you have to start telling the truth. You have to go overboard with the truth. Uh, if you're, uh, sometimes we work out this arrangement, it's not always the case, but where the cheated on partner has full access to their phone for six months or a month or something. It, it's very reassuring to the cheated on partner that they can go into the phone at any time. And sometimes the cheated on partner won't even utilize that privilege. They'll just be like, well, I have that option. And so that just feels good that, uh, and they didn't refuse access when we talked about it in therapy. So I don't need to look at your phone, but I'm just glad that you said it was okay that I have full access to your phone. That's reassuring. Whereas if you said you don't have access to my phone, then that would raise red flags for me. So it's very important that the cheater actually be extremely truthful. But of course, the personality traits or the issue or their psychological personality disorder spectrum or whatever that led up to the cheating in the first place, we can't erase it overnight. We're working on it, but we can't erase it overnight. And so in all likelihood, the tendency to withhold and deny and to uh, downplay and minimize will still be retained. And it's really hard to convince a cheater, to be honest, not always. But so um, now on the other hand, though, there could be a problem from the cheated on partner where they want to know every gory detail and they will invade the space, the life, the emotional world of the cheating partner. They'll be like, okay, I want to know. I want every date. I want exactly what you did. I want all their names. I want all their phone numbers. I want to know, did you orgasm? I want to know what positions you were in. I want, you know, they, they want to know every detail. And Although, so the, the speech I give couples in this situation is, so cheated on partner, you are absolutely, uh, uh, you have the right to ask for those things. And for a lot of those details, you have the right to demand it because if you're gonna move forward to in recovery, then trust and full disclosure is you know probably a part of that. On the other hand, cheated on partner, if you ask all those questions and you get those answers, it could actually ruin your relationship because putting those images in your head can actually kind of like trauma in a sense, like PTSD is not the same, but it just lives in your head. Like a, a visual example of this is Eyes Wide Shut with Tom Hanks and Nicole Kidman where Tom Hanks is a match. I can't remember the exact storyline, but Tom Hanks, it's not Tom Hanks, Tom Cruise. What is that? Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. Tom Cruise is... Uh, uh, perseverating on this image of his wife cheating on him. And he wasn't there, Tom Cruise, the character, but he heard a description or he imagines, I can't remember, but he's playing it over and over again in his head. And that can completely ruin any kind of love that you have for someone. And it can play, it can plague you when you engage in sexual activity, you know, those images that you put in your head. Sometimes just intellectually knowing about the infidelity is enough for you to start recovery and then hearing the details can actually get under your skin. Not always. So I tell the cheating on a partner, you have the right to ask, but you have to be careful about what you what images you put in your head. The other thing is is for I tell I'm telling the cheating on a partner, the impulse to ask those questions might actually be ill conceived. You might actually be trying to alleviate your upsetness or you might feel like you were humiliated so you want to humiliate back or this is your way of, of making them grovel. You want them to relive it so you can shame them or something. And that is not, that's not, that's not conceived in goodness and in recovery. Um, if, if you just, so if you need details to 
put it behind you and to start moving forward and to gain trust. Uh, like an example to delineate this would be the cheated on partner is trying to piece things together if it was a, if it was ongoing infidelity. And the cheating partner is like, so that one time when you were late from work, what, were you cheating then? Because for the cheated on partner, they're trying to get a landscape of what actually happened so that they're not always wondering like the next time that the cheater is late from work you know and, and who was it do i know this person like there are kind of critical details that aren't always necessary but sometimes are in order for the individual to have a, a hold on exactly what happened you know if we put on one end of the spectrum where there's as little information as possible and you know, let's say that you you're in love and you're dedicated, and your partner comes to you and it's just like I cheated on you, and you actually are willing to move towards recovery, and all you know is that that they cheated on you. You don't know how often, you don't know with who, you don't you know you don't know anything. It's just like I cheated on you. There would be a lot of questions naturally, right? Who was it? When? How long? <laughs> um, where was it here? So some questions are natural. And then once you get the general landscape, you're like, oh, okay. So it was for three months and it was not physical and it was emotional over Facebook with a former partner of yours and a, a former partner of, of yours that I've met before. And okay, because that'll help you to know what boundaries, okay, I need you to actually send a a message. I'm going to send a message to that person saying, you know, my partner told me that they cheated with you, and uh, you know, you're done. I hate you <laughs> as a. I no longer want to hang out with you. I can't believe you did that to me. And my partner will no longer be contacting you. And then you know, the partner says, yes, I agree with this. I'm not going to contact with you anymore. I'm sorry. Uh, I feel bad, but uh, this is what's best for my marriage. You know, so you need some detail. But when you get further down the road and you're saying, you know, I want to know exactly how it felt. I want to know where it was. I want to know what positions you're in. You know, that kind of stuff, which people will ask sometimes. You just have to ask what the motivation is and what the intent is and what the ill effects could be down the line on the cheating on partner or the cheated on partner. And that's why it's important to have a therapist because if you as a cheater actually say, I'm not going to tell you that because I don't want to harm you, that could be self-serving. The cheated on partner could interpret it that way. So you need a therapist there to really navigate those waters. And this takes a long time. I mean, when it comes to infidelity recovery, it takes years sometimes decades, I mean, off and on for decades. But anyway, so I applaud her way of describing this to him. And she's also communicating to him her values. She's like, look, cheating, not good, but lying, that's the worst. And so she's communicating to him what her value system is. And this is important. And not everyone has the same values about this. Um, you know, say, for example, for him, he does later on, have a, or maybe he did like maybe he flirted with someone a year and a half ago when he was like you know i don't think i'm ever gonna see jen again it's been two it's you know it, it, the covid and it's been six months and what's the chance so i don't know maybe i'll start flirting so he starts flirting with someone online and uh he is able to say that he's able to say okay well she told me that that's not good but lying about it is worse and what if that comes out? You know, what if they take screenshots of that? So I should just tell her and just be like, okay, well, I'll take the hit now, but it's much better than if I'm caught in a lie, according to her. So I'm just going to tell her, yeah, there was this moment six months ago, and I want to prove to her that I am willing to tell her things so it sets a precedent that she can trust me when I say I didn't do it, you know? So, you know, maybe it'll help him to know those, uh, you know, that ranking of harm and transgression. It hurts me uh, that Jen asks me about like uh, my honesty, my integrity, because I was really faithful from the past two years. But I'm also worried about how I didn't tell Jen that my family is looking a bride for me for arranged marriage. But I can't like tell her right now because it will ruin everything. And oh boy. <laughs> Jenny and Summit all over again. Well, if it's gonna, if reality is gonna ruin everything, then why are you doing this? <laughs> like, he, he's saying, basically, I'm gonna lie by omission. 
because it's going to ruin everything. It's like, well, don't you see the problem with that? Yeah. I mean, he could totally tell her. He'd be like, look, I recommend watching 90 Day Fiance, Jenny and Summit, so you can get a picture of my parents aren't that bad, but they're in that direction. I mean, I don't know. Maybe his parents are even worse. Who knows? We, we haven't seen anything about that yet. So, I mean, we've seen a little bit of the conversations, but we don't know how they're going to react. And so he could do that. Go, Jen, I need you to watch it. And two, I'm going to tell you everything because I'm never going to lie to you and I'm going to tell you everything. There's a chance that my parents are going to reject you and never accept you. Also, my parents are currently, because they don't even know about you, and maybe they would even if they did know about you. They're trying to set me up with a bride. I'm refusing, of course, because I'm with you, but that's happening. I'm pretty sure if you lay it out right, Jen would say, well, that sucks, but thanks for telling me. Whereas if she finds out, which she will now that she watches the show, I'm assuming, she'll be like, wait, you lied by omission. Lying by omission is lying. It's lying. Stop it. And she just came here. Better not f- lie and I'll kill you. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I'm sure from his perspective, he's like, I'm not lying because she didn't ask about that. That's that's a totally different topic. And I'm on a progression of revealing this stuff to her, but I just don't understand that. I, I, I couldn't live that way if I were in a situation. But I think it's, so I don't know, but this is our second, or at least mine, maybe there are others on the show that I haven't watched because I haven't watched everything on the show. But this is our second American white woman with an Indian fella in India. And Summit was so shady. <laughs> about so, He's literally married for multiple years with another person while he was in a relationship with Jenny and hid it from her for years. Hid the engagement, hid the wedding, hid the, the marriage, <laughs> hid... I think they got physical summit. I think I forget, but you know, all that stuff. So that is high shade right there. And we're seeing again, at least an evidence that Rishi is in that direction. And it's just like, what's going on? I think one hypothesis is that when you have a highly oppressive culture that restricts people's freedoms in ways that don't make any sense, let me give a, an analogy. So, When, as a parent, you are parenting a teenager that is going out and going to parties, and you have this hard line that says, you can't drink, you can't smoke a cigarette, you can't smoke marijuana, no drugs, it's just like completely off the table. If you do any of those things, I will disown you, you're going to military school, or whatever like this. Or if you ever date anyone, it's completely done, I'm going to end it. It's We have a zero tolerance policy about you dating, or... If you uh, dress a certain way, you're done. I'm going to disown you. Okay, you know, or something in that direction. You have this very rigid stance. And, you know, parenting's complicated. You can make your own choices. Or, or to add to this, and not only the parents, but also the school and the education system, is drugs are bad, okay? Drugs are always bad. Sex is always bad. It's always bad. All those things are bad. Never, ever do it. Here, let, let me tell you all the things that could happen from bad sex. And I would run into this as a sex educator, as someone who was in charge of sex education for kids and teenagers. I would get this pressure from administration or the teachers that you can only talk about the negative effects of sex. And I was just like, that's not going to help. I mean, certainly we need to talk about the cautionary tales and the things to watch out for, for sure. But if that's all we say, it's not very helpful. Or it's not fully helpful. And plus, we they could just discount us as just fear-mongering, right? So when you do that, and then you have a 16-year-old who is starting to hear things like a friend that had a beer the other night and it was no negative things happened or another friend that had sex with someone and nothing bad happened. They used proper contraception and it was consensual and they wanted to do it and it was enjoyable and your the friend is just like, oh my God, it was the best experience of my life. I want to do it all the time. And you as a 16 year old are just like, wait, so I'm hearing these things and maybe even kind of dabbling in it myself, but everyone else is telling me that it's 100% wrong and it's it's completely off the table and I don't see anything wrong with this. I understand their rules about 
not killing anyone or not stealing anything, but their rules about this, they don't, uh, this doesn't make any sense. There's harm when you steal things from the store or from a friend. There's harm when you murder someone. There's harm when you stab someone. There's harm when you cheat or lie. They have those rules, and I, I, that's logical. But these other rules don't make a lot of sense. I don't see what the harm is in having a beer or in, and I'm not recommending kids drink. <laughs> by any means. They, they really shouldn't. But but this is a scenario that you'll see. Or, you know, my friend kissed a boy the other night, and it was consensual, and she actually won it. She initiated it, and it was like this glorious experience. Uh, all the movies that I see of people having these kinds of experiences, and, you know, that kind of stuff. Anyway, what that does is it basically makes you, as an authority figure, completely questionable, because now the person underneath you is like, well, I don't really trust you. I think that your perspective is flawed. You're not giving me the full picture. You're kind of lying to me. You're telling me all the bad things to try to deter me from doing something, but I'm learning it's actually not that bad. So now I don't know, is everything you said, was was all that talk about sexually transmitted infections and all the bad things you told me about drugs and alcohol, it, is all that hogwash? Because I'm learning that you're not telling me this full story. You're lying by omission. I can't trust you. So now, how do you remedy that? Do you just tell kids everything? I don't know. It's complicated. Every kid's different. Every community's different. Every culture's different. But so my big, long, long-winded point here is that when you have a culture that has this kind of parenting on children, they will learn sometimes early. And I think Summit learned this early, particularly because Summit's dad came to him and said that you just have to appease your mom. Go ahead and lie to your mom. That's what I do. I'm pretty sure some had said that. Like my dad came to me one time and said that, look, your mom's kind of, you know, she's sensitive or she has issues or she's, I don't know, you, but just just tell her what she wants to hear. That's what I do to her. I th I'm pretty sure that's what some had said. So that sets a precedent of deception and lying, often by omission, but sometimes just straight up lying in order to live in harmony with people. You can live in this culture and have all these rules of just like who you can date and what you can do, and then you see stuff going on, and you're just like, well, it's not that bad. I mean, the, yeah, there's some there's some negative consequences, but not as bad as they're making it out. So, and, and there's, su there, there's such a hard line from them about these things that I can't even begin to talk with them about this because, you know, like with Summit's mom, she literally threatened to kill herself over some of these things. So it's just like, well, I can't tell them, but I also don't want to live the life of a nun. So I'm going to, you know, I'll dabble in this. And then it just cascades from there. It sets a precedent that I'm going to live this secret life because that's what I'm going to do. And it makes sense. And I, I have a system of figuring out the risks and I'm going to completely lie to my parents. And that sets this easy lying behavior <laughs> where maybe even to women or something, I don't know, but you're just used to lying to everyone. You just become habitual liars to everyone because it's convenient. And, you know, like for someone like me, I wasn't raised that way, and I've never been in a situation where I was forced into a situation. In fact, my parents were pretty open to stuff like that. Yeah, I would say for the most part, but I was a pretty good kid, so they didn't really have anything to worry about. I mean, there were some things, but <laughs> anyway, particularly later. But the point is, is that I just wonder speculation. We have an N of two, Summit and Rishi, where they seem shady. <laughs> I don't know about Rishi. We just saw one example, but I'm just like, oh no, God, are we heading in that direction again? We do know that he's lying to his parents. He's just straight. He's one of the biggest things of anyone's life is he's going to marry someone and he hasn't even told his parents that she exists, right? Or maybe that she exists, but she, he's not going to. So, wow. Just imagine that. Just imagine you have a kid who is having an ongoing, and they're on a reality TV show. <laughs> and by the way, I'm trying to figure out what they're telling the parents. Because if he hasn't told the parents about Jen, what is he telling the parents about the, th about the film crew? Is he just saying, it's a documentary about me? <laughs> I don't know. Or is it all just kind of smoke and mirrors? I don't know. But <sighs> I just have a prediction that I'm going to be I'm just going to go on the same journey with Rishi as I did with Summit, where I'm just like so frustrated with the deception and so upset at a culture. I don't want to talk bad about another country or another culture, but I've heard from a lot of Indian people. They'll email me or talk to me, friends of mine. They'll say, India, you know, there's a lot of people live there and there's a lot of different 
pockets of cultures, a lot of different practices. But in general, it's pretty normalized for parents to be that way. And there are positives, right? Uh, there are a lot of kids in the United States who lose their way and harm themselves with drugs and alcohol, sex, dropping out of school or whatever, experimentation with too much freedom. So pros and cons. <laughs> but I, I just... I got to figure that in India, there are families that navigate this much better. They're just like, look, there's a hard line about da 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 da, but we love you and, you know, don't lie to us. You tell us we can work with it. But it would really be disappointing if you did this and that. But I'm, I'm not going to kill myself and I'm not going to disown you. But cause you, so, you know, there's a way of having a hard line without giving, forcing a child into a position where they almost have to lie to you and then. What lesson are you telling them and what habit are you forming in them? And then they're going to start lying to their partner by omission and then it ruins their life. Is that really what's best for them? I don't know. What do you think? I'm way out on a limb here. All right. Well, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.